Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSC. This is a tutorial video for Physics Paper 4 Theory from May-June 2024 examinations. Question 1. A load is suspended from a thread. The vertical force of the thread due to the load is 0.75 Newton. Vertical force means the force is acting downwards. So the force acting downwards is the weight. Question A. Calculate the mass of the load. We are given with the weight and we are asked to calculate the mass. The relationship between weight and mass. Weight equals to mass times gravitational acceleration. So to calculate the mass, we can just rearrange this formula which is weight divided by its gravitational acceleration. The weight is 0.75 and the gravitational acceleration has been given to you on the first page which is 9.8. So just substitute that value into your formula and using your calculator, you will get 0.0765 which rounded off to two significant figures would be 0.077 and the unit for mass is kilograms. Next question part B. Figure 1.1 shows the load suspended from the thread. A wire is attached to the load at point X and pulled horizontally to the right. So this is the direction. The tension in the horizontal wire is 1.2 Newton. So the tension here is at 1.2 Newton. By drawing a scale diagram or by calculation, determine the magnitude of the resultant force at X and the direction of the resultant. Alright, so you have been given option to either draw a scale diagram or calculate. Since I'm solving this on my iPad, I'm going to choose by calculation. If you need further explanation on drawing a scale diagram and calculation, you can watch the video that I have linked up here to understand better. Okay, so we have two forces right now, one acting vertically downwards, which is 0.75 newtons, and another force acting to the right, which is 1.2 newton. Alright, firstly, we're just going to sketch the vectors at right angles to each other like this. Next, assuming that this is a rectangle, we're going to complete this rectangle by drawing a diagonal end from corner to corner, like this. And now we're going to calculate the magnitude and the direction, which is the angle, for the resultant vector. Since I'm going to solve this using a trigonometry, I'm going to use the rule of Pythagoras theorem whereby c square is equal to a square plus b square. c square here being our hypotenuse, this can be our a and this can be b. So 0.75 square adding with 1.2 square. So square bring it to the other side would become square root. So the value of C, which is the magnitude of the resultant force, would be 1.42 and the unit is newtons. Next, we're going to look for the direction. Since the load is being pulled this way, the load will shift like this. So this is the angle that we're going to look for to determine the direction of the resultant relative to this direction. To do that, we're going to use trigonometry. This is the angle and you have an opposite and adjacent value. So tan theta would be equal to opposite over adjacent. So theta would be 1.2 newtons over 0.75 newtons, which is 57.99. Rounding off to two significant figures would be 58 degree. So the magnitude at two significant figures would be 1.4 and the angle, which is the direction of the resultant force is 58 degree. As you can see, the units have already been provided for you. If they are not given, please remember to always include your units in your final answer. Next question, part C. Forces may produce changes in size and the shape of an object. State two other changes that forces may produce. So forces can change the direction of an object, the speed of the object moving or its acceleration. So you can pick two out of any of these four. Next question 2 part A. Define acceleration. All definitions and formula has already been given you in the syllabus of the subject. Just make sure that you are looking at the right course specification which is 2023 to 2025. I will link this PDF file in the description box below. Be sure to print this out and use this as your revision guide. If you look into 1.2 motion, you will see that it has already been given to you that the definition of acceleration is the change of velocity per unit time and this is the formula that has already been given. Question B. A train has a total mass of 520,000 kg. The train accelerates at 1.1 meters per second square. Calculate the time taken for the train to increase its speed from 15 meters per second to 28 meters per second. We are looking to find the time taken for this to happen. 
we have been given with the initial mass of 15 meters per second and final mass of 28 meters per second. We are also given with its acceleration which is 1.1 meters per second square and the mass. In order to find time, we can see that which formula is related to all the information that we have over here. And that would be the formula of acceleration which is V minus U over T. We have the value for A, V and U and we are looking for the value of T. If we rearrange this formula, it will be V minus U over A. So you can substitute these values into your formula and the time obtained would be 11.8. Changing this into two significant figures would be 12 and the unit for time is seconds. Next, calculate the force required to produce an acceleration of 1.1 meters per second square for this train. The formula to calculate force when given mass and its acceleration is F equals to MA. So the mass is 520,000 and the acceleration is 1.1 and you will get 572,000. Changing this into two significant figures would be 570,000. Do not forget to include your unit which is newtons for force. Next part 3. The train uses electric motors. Explain why the force on the train due to the motors is greater than the value calculated in part 2. So they're saying that the actual force that accelerates the train is significantly higher than this value which was calculated. And we are asked to explain the reason why. Now when we calculate the force over here, we are just calculating the mass times its acceleration. However, in real life, we have to consider factors like there is wind on the opposite direction, which is the air resistance slowing the train down. There's also huge friction between the train tires and the railway track which can slow down the train, hence increases the force to accelerate the train forward. So those are the reasons why the actual force is higher than the value calculated. Next question 3. A student drops a heavy ball from a vertical height of 1.8 meters above the ground. The ball then falls to the ground and it does not bounce after hitting the ground. This means that once the ball reaches the ground, its final velocity is 0 meters per second. Question part A. Describe the transfers of energy of the ball between stores from when the ball begins to fall to when it reaches the ground. Okay, when the ball is at its highest point, which is above the ground, it stores the highest gravitational potential energy. And when it starts to fall down, the gravitational potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy that is being stored increases as it falls down to the ground. And finally, when it stops, it has zero gravitational potential energy and zero kinetic energy. So all this energy will now be transferred into thermal energy. So if you touch the surface of the ball, you will feel it's hot. This is due to the energy being transferred into thermal energy. So for three marks, you could write something like this. Next question part B. Calculate the maximum speed of the ball. Ignore the air resistance and show all your working. Alright, since this question here is discussing on the change of energy from gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy, we are going to use the principle of conservation of energy where the gravitational potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy. The formula for gravitational potential energy is mass times gravity times height. And the formula for kinetic energy is 1 over 2 times mass times velocity squared. Since we are looking to find the velocity, this is the right formula that we should use. Since there is mass on the both side, we can just cancel it out. The value of G is 9.8 and the value of h which is height above the ground is 1.8 meters. So rearranging this formula, we will get 5.939 and so on. So we're going to change this only to two significant figures. So the answer would be 5.9 and the value for speed is meters per second. Next question 4a. State two ways that evaporation differs from boiling. The process of evaporation when liquid changes into gas only happens at the surface of the liquid, whereas for boiling, the heat is being transferred throughout all the liquid. The next difference is that boiling only happens at a specific temperature where the liquid can convert into gas. However, evaporation, liquid can convert into gas at any given temperature. Next, question B. Figure 4.1 shows part of a container used to store a mixture of liquid and gaseous oxygen. So the walls are made of steel, however, in between the walls, the space here is vacuum. Vacuum means there are no any particles present. 
All right, question part one. The temperature of the liquid is negative 160 degrees Celsius. Determine the temperature of the liquid in Kelvin. So this is the conversion. The temperature in degrees Celsius is negative 160 degrees Celsius. So just add up with 273 and you will convert it into Kelvin. And that value would be 113 Kelvin. Next part two. The container is made of steel and there is a vacuum between the inner and outer walls. The outer wall of the container is at room temperature. State two methods of thermal energy transfer that a vacuum prevents. So there are three methods whereby thermal energy can be transferred. The first one is conduction, which happens in solid. The second is convection, which transfers in fluid. And lastly is radiation, where it's transferred in a vacuum. So in a vacuum, conduction and convection will not be able to take place as the medium needed is a solid and a fluid. Next question C. Describe in terms of particles how a gas exerts a pressure on the walls of its container. The gas particles in the container will collide with each other and the inner wall of the container. These particles now exert force on the inner wall. And pressure is the force per unit area. So this is how pressure is being exerted on the wall. Next question 5. Figure 5.1 shows a ray of yellow light incident on a glass prism ABC. Okay, question A. Explain why the ray does not change direction when it enters the prism at phase AB. So when the light enters, it doesn't bend this way or this way or even get reflected. Instead, it travels all the way in a straight line. The reason is because when a ray of light strikes the boundary at a 90 degree angle, it will continue to travel in a straight line without changing any direction. Next question B. The critical angle for the glass is 42 degree. Calculate the refractive index of the glass. Some of the formulas that you have to remember from your chapter of light is that the value of refractive index is equal to 1 over sine C. C being the critical angle. So the formula related to critical angle and refractive index is n equals to 1 over sine c and the value of refractive index would be 1.5. Next question part 2 on figure 5.1. Continue the path of light through the prism and after it leaves the prism. Okay. Okay, in order to continue the path of the ray of light, we're going to need a protractor. So the first thing we're going to find is the incidence angle. Only then we can identify whether the ray of light would reflect, travel through the prism, or get refracted into the air. So the angle that I have obtained is somewhere around 58 degree. Now we're going to have to find out whether it reflects, goes through the prism, or gets refracted out into the air. And to identify that, we first must know these three rules. If the incidence angle is bigger than the critical angle, the ray would be reflected here. If the incidence angle is equal to the critical angle, the ray would continue to run along the boundary. And if the incidence angle is smaller than the critical angle, then the ray of light will be refracted out of the glass. So let's look at the critical angle. The critical angle here is 42 degree. So the incidence ray is larger than the critical angle. So what's going to happen here is that the ray is going to be reflected. So remember that when the ray is reflected, it will reflect at the same angle of the incidence. So that would be 58 degree as well, which is actually going to end up being a straight line. And now that it enters the face of AC at a 90 degree angle, as we discussed previously, so the ray of light now will continue to travel in a straight line. So this is what your final ray of diagram should look like. Next question part C. Internet data can be transferred using infrared waves in an optical fiber. State two advantages of using optical fibers to transmit data. Since this question is theoretical, we can easily get the answer from the cost specification. Under chapter 3, you will see that the advantages of using optical fibers, which is due to its transparency to visible light and that they can carry high rates of data. So you can mention those two in your answer space. Next question 6. A sound wave travels through the air. Figure 6.1 shows a pressure time graph for the air at one place. Alright, part 1. Label one point C to indicate a compression and one point R to indicate a refraction. Now remember that compression is a region of higher pressure. So we are going to label point C over here which is the highest point of the wave and refraction is the region of a lower pressure. 
So we are going to label R here at the lowest point of the wave. Next part 2. Explain why this graph cannot be useful to find the wavelength of the sound wave. To find the wavelength of a sound wave, we are going to need the displacement. And we have not been given with the displacement in this graph. So we can't use this graph to find the wavelength. Next part 3. The sound becomes louder and lower pitch. See what happens to the amplitude and the frequency. Amplitude is the height of the wave. The bigger the height of the wave, the louder the sound would be. So if the sound becomes louder, it means that the amplitude increases. And the frequency of the sound relies on how close the wavelengths are to each other. The closer they are, the higher the pitch. And the further away they are from each other, the lower the pitch. So for lower pitch, the wavelengths will be further away from each other. Means that the frequency right now decreases. A higher frequency means that a higher pitch and the wavelength would be more closer to each other. Next question B. A sound frequency 13 kHz is transmitted through water. The speed of sound in water is 1500 meters per second and we are asked to calculate the wavelength. The formula related to wavelength, speed and frequency is V equals to frequency times lambda. Lambda here is the wavelength which we are looking for. So rearranging this formula, we would get velocity over frequency. Velocity given is 1500 meters per second. There is no need for us to do any unit conversion because meters per second is the standard SI unit. However, the frequency given here is in kilohertz and we have to convert this to hertz. Kilo means times 10 to the power of 3. So it will be 13 times 10 to the power of 3 hertz. And the wavelength that we will obtain is 0.12. And the unit here would be meters. Next question part C. State the approximate speed of sound in air. The speed of sound in air is approximately 330 to 350 meters per second. So you can write any value between 330 to 350 including your unit. Alright guys, that's all for this video. I'll be discussing question 7 to question 11 on the next video. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.